full time. There's a lot of stuff that Angie talks about on this episode that is extremely relatable for any gym owner out there and is extremely revelatory for any member out there to know about what their gym owner might be going through. This is one that I truly hope that you give a good listen to, and I would love to hear your feedback when it's over. Let's get you to Angie. At Active Life, we believe that the healthcare clinic of the future is the gym. Everybody starts with the best case scenario in mind. Never sell anything to anybody who is not in the market for what you have. The only reason we work out is to create the opportunity to recover. And the healthcare provider of the future is the coach. And this is why you guys need to get paid well, because what you're doing is really, really hard work. Angie Halverson, welcome to the Active Life Podcast. Thank you, Sean. It's my pleasure. Uh, as I was telling you before, you're, the reason I wanted to have you on the show today is because within the community of Active Life clients, you're somebody who I find to be an inspirational figure among those in the group. Reason being, when you show up to the Friday calls with all the gym owners, you contribute, you're able to provide support. And at the same time, you're able to share vulnerabilities that you have and afford other people the ability to help you. And you've really made a lot of the the most difficult transitions uh, with grace. And so I wanted to talk to you about just what that's been like. Okay. So my first question to you is when you first opened your gym, I don't know how long ago it was, if I'm not mistaken, six or seven years ago. Okay. Uh, what did you think it would be? What were you getting into it for? When I first opened the gym, uh, first bought the gym, um, I had taken it over from someone who really just wanted a place to play and hang out. Um, I was taking over a CrossFit gym, but it was a CrossFit gym that I knew could be more. Uh, I have, I have come out of the addictions field. So I spent close to 20 years working as a policy advocate and a business development project manager, um, for addiction treatment and prevention providers all over the country. Um, I worked for a company based out of Boston and we were very much deep into healthcare reform and looking at helping these small mom and pop addiction facilities create business streams and really be able to engage in healthcare on a much bigger level, competing with the larger, uh, the larger uh, health systems. And through that work, I had worked with a lot of people who recognized sort of this whole health approach to addiction, right? So addiction is just one component of some lifestyle choices, some mental health challenges, and there's a way to heal people through a broader whole health approach. And so when I started, bought the gym, I knew that working through fitness, and I've been in, I, by that time, I'd been in the fitness space about 10 years. And I knew when the people that I had worked with as a coach in those 10 years previously, coupled with my experience in the healthcare and addictions field, I knew that there was a way to bring a lot of these things together and address people in a very broad approach to health. And I wanted to do that through fitness. I, I had gotten healthy through fitness. I had um, helped many people through some one-on-one -on -one work I had done through a garage, my garage gym when I got started. And so when I started and, and opened Carlisle CrossFit under our ownership, that's what I saw the gym becoming. Um, I saw us being bigger and reaching into the community deeper. Um, I saw us uh, working on in a, in a in the corporate space with companies that were you know interested in keeping their uh, employees healthy, um, decreasing lost productivity time and increasing um, you know work productivity as well as decreasing healthcare expenditures and, and insurance premiums and all of those things. Um, and so that's what I saw. And that's what I've always seen since I've started in this business. Um, and I think, again, a lot of that's because of the space I came out of in a broader healthcare environment. 
um, I've always seen that we could become a facility where people got well and stayed well on an individual and a community basis. What made you decide to do that inside of an existing facility where the previous ownership was just looking for a place to have fun instead of starting from scratch in, in a facility that you would have total control over from very day one, including the culture, the systems, all of it? Um, because it, it, honestly, the opportunity presented itself and it's what I had available to me at the time. And it, it was what I was familiar with. I had come through the CrossFit ranks. That's where I started. That's where I got into fitness in 2010. Um, and so that's what I was familiar with. And so I was presented with the opportunity to purchase the gym in its entirety and so rather than going out and trying to start over somewhere, I felt like, you know, this was my opportunity and, I, and we took it. So when you take over the gym in the very beginning, did you, you're obviously taking over someone else's hobby and working to turn it into your livelihood. Mm -hmm. When you do that, what kind of resistance did you face? What kind of struggles did you face just from going from, you know, play and fun CrossFit to business and effective CrossFit? Um, you know, the first, the first pushback I got was simply equalizing and normalizing rates, um, because it had been a hobby for the previous owner. Um, you know, people were paying all kinds of different rates and they were getting the same general services. Some people were paying $20 a month. Some people were paying five. Some people were on a, well, just pay as you feel like basis. And that was one of the first things that we did was to just simply normalize all of that. Um, that was my first pushback. So I, I lost, you know, several people. Um, and we, you know, we, we dropped quite a few members. Um, but we just kind of kept pushing through. Um, the first real pushback came, you know, we probably ran it sort of in that more traditional uh, arena for about a year year and a half, um, with some small tweaks here and there where we changed some of the class structure. Um, but we were still sort of in that CrossFit space. The first real significant change came post COVID when we opened back up after the shutdown in 2020. And we opened back up with a new model where it was uh, personal training on ramp. So everybody did the personal training, regardless of your experience in the fitness space. Um, and we decreased the size of our group classes. We went from, you know, 20 people to a group class down to 10, 12, maybe 14 on the outset. Um, we that was, hold on, that, was by, that was by choice or that was because you lost members. That was by choice. Um, because we knew there was a better way to give people better attention in classes than to have these giant classes of people where you could barely manage the class size. You, you know, the space was crazy. There were things going everywhere. Um, and, you know, plus COVID had a little bit to do with that as well, because we were required, you know, we had to have our little squares and our little spaces. Um, the other thing was we started taking out some of the more traditional cross-fitty kind of movements that are more complicated and that frankly the majority of my people don't have the mobility to do without a lot of ex extra work and individual training. Um, there was a lot of resistance to that um, when we started shifting away from what people saw as sort of a traditional high intensity go hard every day crossfit kind of thing to a more um, you know let's program in some some more active recovery days. Let's talk about rest. Let's focus on recovery. Let's not go hard every day. You don't need to be dead on the floor every day. Um, we don't want to be your best hour of the day. You have 23 other hours you need to be healthy for. I don't need you dead just because of my, you know, coming to my classes. Um, so we got some pushback on that. That was probably the first biggest set of pushbacks that we got. 
Well, well, a few questions to that. Number one is, did did you announce to the group that we're going to change the programming this way? Or did people just understand as they went through it, hey, we haven't done snatches in like three weeks. We used to do them fairly frequently. We haven't been exhausted after every workout like we used to be. How did that transition happen? We did talk about it. I wouldn't say we like stood on the rooftops and announced it, but we basically put out Hey, welcome back post COVID. You know, we're glad to have you back in the gym. We're going to bring everybody back into the gym kind of in this ease into it sort of methodology, but we're going to continue that over time. And we're going to begin to shift and adjust our programming so that we're keeping everybody healthy and we're focusing more on overall general health. Um, So we did announce it, but we didn't make it a big deal. We just tried to. In, integrated into the culture as a part of the daily course of business. And how did the members respond? Like you got pushback, which mm-hmm. is to be expected. I mean, like if you used to do muscle ups four days a week and now you do it three, people are like we need to do more muscle ups. Everybody becomes an exercise physiologist when the program changes, no matter what the program changed from into. Right. How did you handle the pushback? How did the staff handle the pushback? Well, we had kind of a a set messaging um, and, you know, a lot of that came out of the active life work that we had done with you and your staff around, you know, why it's important to focus on a general health approach. Um, And we lost some members. I mean, we, I don't know, we probably lost 10 people, Um, but we made that up in people who were really more interested in just general fitness. Um, so while I regret, you know, the loss of some of those people, we were able to further expand our services to people who really need it. It's that larger 90% of people who really want general health as opposed to the 10% of people who want all of those, you know, more complex, complicated movements and that constant high intensity go hard all the time. Well, I think it's, it's it's a difficult place that any gym owner finds himself in is once you decide to open the gym, you're in a niche. You're, you're looking for people who are intentionally active and spend money on their activity. Then when you go into, I'm going to be a CrossFit gym, or I'm going to be a Zumba gym, or I'm going to be an Orange Theory, it's a segment of that niche. And then when you decide how you're going to execute your version of it, you're a segment of a segment of a niche. And what you're describing is wanting to be able to help the person who is more looking to be able to reclaim the active life that they have always loved and wanted to be a part of and be able to keep it as compared to the person who is just looking for maximum physical expression of their ability. You know, like I can now go faster, heavier, all that kind of stuff, which is a totally different market altogether. You mentioned that you lost 10 members, but it, it was okay. You, you regret losing people. You always regret the relationships that you're not able to keep when you like people, but that it paved the way for other people to join. And what I want to ask you about is you spoke about it well, but it always sucks when you're in it, no matter who left, even if it's the person who you're like, oh man, I'm so glad Adam finally quit the gym. He was <laughs> such a pain in the ass. But then you're still like, but why did he quit? Like what, what, right. what, what was that like? I was, um, let, let, me, let me give you a frame of reference to, to answer okay. that. I was talking to another gym owner this morning who is in the early phase of what you were describing. And the members are starting to sense, hold on a second. We're not going to go hard all day, every day. And you're going to reduce the class size and change the pricing. There's a gym down the block that will still put 40 people into a class and they just throw down every day. I think I want to go there. And the gym owner, while he's not experiencing big turnover, he's experiencing enough turnover, slowly enough, that every three days or so, he's like, ah, oh, come on, you too? <laughs> and, and, and he forgets that four people joined this week, each of whom bought 12 personal training sessions up front, plus their membership to start. He's, a, he's focusing on another person decided that they don't want what we're moving towards. So it sucks when you're in the moment because it feels personal. What what was that like for you? And how did you help the staff stay strong through it? You know, it, and it still sucks. I mean, and I think it always will because I take pride of ownership and I am 
personally invested in all of my members. And I have always made it my responsibility to know my members. And when I walk in the door, I want to be able to call them all by name and I want to be able to know them and at least know a little bit about them. So whenever anybody leaves, it's, it is, if there's a little bit of a gut wrench there, there's like, God, really? And it's funny because we had a, our staff meeting, our in-person staff meeting on Tuesday. And my head coach, John is, is responsible for our retention. And I'm like, so John, how's things going in retention? Like it sucks in retention bill this week. <laughs> and we've had, we've had, we've had three people submit their, you know, their requests to, to drop their membership. And it's like, that's three people. And I'm like, and, and, and my salesperson, Tyra, she's sitting right next to him. And she says, well, we've added seven this month, you know, so it's still hard. I think, you know, they still, they and I still struggle every time we, we have a member that drops. Um, but over time, we've, we've worked to develop the perspective that we aren't for everyone, that there are people that are going to go to the Y and they're going to find the Zumba class or the spin class more to their liking. And, but we have to look at this from a viewpoint of abundancy as opposed to, um, you know, a lack of opportunity because there are, you know, there's 20,000 people in my community and to get where I want to be, I really only need like 2% of them, you know, to walk in my door. Um, and so I think if, you know, I, and I keep telling them this, I mean, we have to look at this from, from the, the perspective of abundance because there, there's a huge need out there for what we offer. And the more we focus on the value that we bring to people in the general health space, the better off we are for, um, you know, feeling less personal or less affronted every time somebody leaves. I think the reason why, and I, my own personal experience, why it's difficult when people leave is because despite the fact that maybe your gym is not the place for them to get what they wanted to get. And you're aware of that. You want to help everybody who is in your purview. When somebody leaves, it's basically them saying, you're not helping me the way that I hoped that you would. And mm -hmm. we got to go. And as somebody who opens a fitness business or a healthcare business, it's like, well, damn, I'm setting out to help people. How am I not helping you? And it's, it's, it's important in that moment to reflect on if they left your gym to go to the CrossFit gym in town, which looks similar, has similar equipment to what you have and programs similarly enough that people could potentially mistake it if they were just looking at one day. It's as different as somebody saying, I want to go try Pilates on the reformer. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that, that makes perfect sense. We don't have reformers here. Right. Uh, and it's, just, it's, it's hard perspective to keep. How did the staff, one of the biggest issues that gym owners typically run into is they feel like they want to shift what they're doing. And the team who were inspired to be a part of the gym because of what the gym was doing, don't share that belief. How did you communicate with the staff and galvanize them to, to stand behind you in the way that they do? Um, to be honest, I thank God every day that they show up to work and support my vision. And so there are days I still stand in my gym and I look at my staff like last night. I mean, it was absolutely buzzing. We had teens class. We had adult classes. We had on-ramp going on. We had one-on-one -on -one personal training sessions going on. And I look at that and I say, oh my God, this is what I've been working for. How did this happen? So sometimes I don't even know um, how... I got such an amazing group of staff members to believe in what I saw as a possibility. Um, uh, maybe, you know, I've sort of, I, I, I guess I've stuck to my guns the whole time. And while there have been moments where I've been, okay, maybe we shouldn't do this. Uh, we haven't chased the latest fad or tried to, meet the, you know, the current member who's telling us we don't, you know, we suck and we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. Um, it, it's just been a matter of, you know, what we're going to stand fast and we're going to stand true 
to what we know is the best approach. Um, and, and, and they all have, we all have doubts. There are periods of time where one or the other of my coaches will come to me and, and, and there's a doubt there. Um, but we've kept taking that step forward and, and sticking with what we know is the right way to do things and reminding each other, you know what you had, you, you may have lost this lady, but you know what, we still have her husband and he just cleared uh, his wrist flexion test for the first time in two years and can stand in a front rack position um, without pain in either elbow or wrist. So, you know, where's the win, right? And the loss doesn't seem as bad. What's the most recent doubt that either you or the team has overcome? Is our programming really the right approach? That's probably been the biggest one recently that we've overcome. Um, There's still a lot of doubts floating around, but I think the programming piece, it's taken us about 18 months, I think, to get everybody on staff to a point where, you know what, you don't like our programming, I'm sorry, but it's what we believe is the right way to go. And that's what we're going to keep doing. Um, and I don't hear any doubts from the staff anymore on the programming. Um, that was hard. That was really hard. Do you, and, and that's, you say 18 months, that's about when we got started together. Yes. Yep. Yes. So when the staff would bring up their doubts, one thing I will give you and your staff a lot of credit for is you allowed them to have their doubts while, continuing to deliver a high level of what it is that you believed was valuable and important. Instead of saying, if you don't believe in this, you just need to go. Uh, you, you did a good job of recognizing it took them time to believe in what they believed in before. It's going to take them time to believe in this also, and that's okay. How did they express their doubts to you and how did you handle that expression? Yeah, I think most of them were comfortable saying either in the, you know, the staff group or to me specifically, um, you know, uh, are we doing the right thing? And, and I guess I don't really remember anybody saying, are we doing the right thing? It was more of an expression of, well, maybe we should do something different. You know, is there something else we could do? I think it was more that. Um, and sometimes those came up in group conversations and sometimes they came up in, you know, the quarterly meetings I have with my staff every quarter. Um, and I think I, you know, we dealt with it by talking about the successes that we had. Um, and we've had a lot and I, we don't always take a look at that and step back. We've gotten much better sharing our shout outs. We put our shout outs in our weekly newsletter. Um, we have a Slack channel of shout outs. So every time something cool happens in the gym, it doesn't even have to be a PR, but you know, somebody showed up two days in a row. Hey, that's a shout out. Um, you know, and we share those things. And I think that's absolutely critical to reinforcing that what we're doing is the right thing and erasing those or easing. I don't say we erase, but easing those doubts. Mm-hmm. Well, everything is a trade off. No matter what you're doing, you're making a trade-off. If you're if you're not doing something that was super intense, you're you're trading off the benefit of the super intense exercise in terms of a, a physiological adaptation for what you get from a less intense workout. And right. so there's always going to be the the cynicism of the opportunity cost for everybody, including you, including me, including coaches, including members. It's I think that what you're doing really well with the consistency is affording people the opportunity to see with objectivity, this is working for me better than that was working for me. And so while I might always wonder what would it be like if I'm very happy with what I have right now, you know, um, I'll get in trouble for saying this on a podcast, but you know, everyone has had an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend. They're like, I wonder what it would have been like if that ended up being the person. Mm-hmm. I'm not longing for it. I'm very happy with my wife. I'm right. not looking elsewhere. 
you think about it from time to time. I wonder what that would have been like. Um, and so it's reasonable for people to keep thinking about the fitness from that perspective. What made you decide a year and a half ago that um, you thought we could help you? Uh, so I had attended a weekend seminar in Texas. I actually flew from Pennsylvania to Texas to Asia Bartos gym, uh, behemoth and attended the, um, uh, the movement screen seminar down there. And my coach Maria had been connected to active life through group. She's a brute athlete and has been for years. Mm-hmm. And, and so she was familiar with, you know, sh- with you and with your methods through Groot. And so I attended the seminar and started following what you were doing through social media. And I think I almost sort of like one of your posts where it was like, Hey, you know, DM us if this is you. And it was almost just sort of like, okay, I'll DM them. see What happens? And immediately Larry like responded and um, you know, of course, in, you know, you know, the story, right. We went back and forth forever, mm-hmm. um, back and forth, back and forth. And the more I listened to your online presence, the more I watched what you were doing through social. And I actually had signed up for bulletproof shoulders because my shoulders were fried. I was trying to do group and it was, while I liked the programming, it was the wrong thing for me. Um, and I, my, my shoulders were just jacked up. And so I started doing bulletproof shoulders and loved it. Started incorporating some of those things into my own personal training work that I was doing with clients and into classes. Um, and so kind of through that experience, I had, um, again, been watching you guys. And so I started talking with Larry and, and knew that we were on the cusp of doing more and I wanted to do more. And I felt like, you know what, I don't think I can do this by myself. I can't move this organization, the direction I want it to go without this stuff. And I liked the immersion work that you guys were promoting. Um, and I'm like, this is what I want. This is what I want my gym to be. I want to be an active life gym. Um, and because it meshed with what my vision for a broader health approach to, uh, to, to fitness was all about. And so that's, that's really what sort of tipped the scales for me was knowing where I wanted to go, knowing that I couldn't get there by myself or I could, but it would take me forever. Um, because at the time I was still working full time as well. And I was managing the gym uh, on the side. You know, my husband was doing the books at night. I was trying to work in my contract consulting work around coaching classes and training PT clients. And I knew I couldn't do it alone. So that was really it for me. I just needed, I needed somebody, something to help me bring all of these thoughts together and make it work. I will never forget um, talking to Bob, your husband. <laughs> um, when, 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 when uh, we were going into our second year of working together, and he's asking about basically the, the 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 benefits and the features of continuing, and he's in his military uh, camos, and he's at a whiteboard writing down everything I'm saying. To him. Like, this, is, this is a unique experience to say the least. Um, so, what I think is so interesting about the way that you just described how you decided to come and work with us is, I think it's exactly the same as the way that any member who joins any gym makes the same decision for themselves. They're looking at what are you, you know, they see what you're saying. They get a little bit interested and they're like, maybe this could work for me. And then you give them an opportunity to speak with you. And if you as the gym owner try to go right in for the sale, like, okay, great. They're here. I'm going to sell them something They're That's not what they came for. They came for help. Right. If you allow yourself to have a long-term relationship with these people through your content, they will start to see for themselves, okay, I want my life to change in the direction that this gym keeps talking about changing people's lives. And they're providing me enough information to believe that they can actually do it. Let me now find out what it's like to be a client and see if I want to go there. And then it's much easier, despite the fact that it took weeks or months for you to go from I'm interested to yes, right? Um. 
I just think that's an important lesson for, for me, for you, and for everyone who's going to listen to this. Yeah. Um, how has the life of the coaches in the gym changed? I know that, for example, um, I believe Maria was a teacher when, when you all first started this. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious as to their confidence and their inspiration inside of the gym. Um, so I have three full-time staff, a little backstory on, on my, uh, our staff. I, we have three full-time staff and, uh, one was a teacher, um, Tyra, she taught in a, a high risk youth, um, facility for several years and she quit her job to come work for us. Uh, my other my head coach, John, uh, is a physical therapy assistant and was looking to get back into this area and the timing worked out perfectly. Um, you know, I think for, for them, one, they've gotten a lot busier. Um, they are doing work that they're all very good at uh, and they're doing it full time. And I don't know that any of them ever would have envisioned this as a full-time gig, um, doing this type of work. What is full-time? Even, mean? You, you know, uh, the, re- the reason I'm yeah. asking that is because uh, everyone has their own definition. And if you work full-time at McDonald's, you're still broke. Right. Um, full-time is anywhere from 25 to 30 floor hours, group and personal training combined um, on the floor. And then programming, uh, for their individual clients. Uh, Tyra is my marketing and sales director. So she's does all of our social media posts, does all of our community outreach. And so she does that. She spends a considerable amount of time doing that. John is, is our retention, uh, and member services manager. And he spends a considerable amount of time, you know, keeping track of members who haven't been in the gym in, you know, a few days tracking members who might have issues, you know, I tweaked my back, my ankles hurt, whatever. Um, and then Caden, my, my other full-time coach, uh, she runs our youth program. So, um, you know, not only are they doing floor hours, but they're also, they've got a lot of other duties as a sign. Um, and they, um, again, I just think that, you know, probably the biggest change is that they're actually doing this full-time and they like it and they're making, you know, a decent salary. Um, my goal over the next, you know, 18 months is to be able to provide them with a little bit more, um, you know, so that they're comfortable and they don't have to be concerned about, you know, making enough. But um, for the most part, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a full-time gig that I don't know that they ever expected. Well, as, as I know, you've talked about with, the mentor who's been assigned to you specifically to go through the material. The first step might be to make sure that you're paid more. And the next step would be to make sure that they're paid more. So you're pouring from a a cup with something in it. Right. And I think that um, one of the things that you described well, that is the, the opposite of what I believe most gym owners unfortunately do is the first thing that you looked to do was create a safe landing for the people who are working inside of the gym at, at cost to yourself, right? If we're being honest about it, it's your, you figured out a way to first and foremost, make sure that the jobs in the gym could get done without you having to do all of the jobs at the expense of some of your own income. And that sets you up to, to grow without having to extend yourself in such a way that is just untenable. Mm -hmm. Right. I think the delicate balancing act is when do you turn the focus onto yourself so that you can be made whole and keep the staff happy and inspired and safe at the same time. Would you, would you agree that that's kind of a a spot you find yourself in and it's difficult to, to wrangle? Yes, absolutely. Why did you choose to first, I don't want to say take care of the staff at the um, complete expense of yourself because it's not as if you've started taking money out of your savings to make sure that people are are paid and then you could have just closed the gym and not dealt with that. So you're not a martyr 
by any stretch of the imagination. But what made you decide to prioritize getting staff whole first instead of saying, okay, look, I'm going to pay you 20 bucks an hour. And once I make X number of dollars myself, I'm going to start paying you more. Why did you go the other way? Because I I cannot do this and I cannot have a facility that serves members with any level of value if my staff aren't happy, right? If my staff are constantly concerned about where their next dollar is going to come from and if they begin to resent the fact that they have to work for somebody who's taking money first, um, everything that I believe in falls apart and we go nowhere. And so having a staff that is content, that is invested, that can see that, you know, they may not be making what they want to make now, but there's a path to that. That's more important. Um, and I have to be frank. I mean, I'm blessed. I'm married to a military officer. So I'm not in a position where I have to, you know, take money out of savings or, you know, uh, sacrifice on that side of it. I'm blessed to be able to focus on my staff and be able to do that. I know not everybody is able to do that. So I understand the unique position that I'm in. Um, but I do see that, you know, without the amount, you know, the, the commitment from the people that work for me, uh, I go nowhere. There's, there's two things you said that I want to push back on you on a little bit. The first one is it's never enough. Nobody, nobody ever says, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm paid enough. I don't want right. to raise. I'm, I'm good. So, <laughs> right. so there'll never be a number where you're like, oh, everybody is just completely thrilled. They have no interest in a pay raise. It's great. That will never happen. Right. The second thing is you mentioned that you didn't have to focus on yourself because you have Bob who's able to support the family while you support the staff so that you can ultimately support yourself as well. My pushback on that is the difference would have been you would have taken on more work and paid yourself for the work that you were doing that you were able to delegate to other staff members. Maybe instead of having three full-time staff, you would have had two and you would have been the third full-time staff, making sure that you got paid enough to be able to contribute to the household as well. So it's, um, it's the, the degree to which you've continued to invest in the gym that is different than somebody who would be the only one providing to a family not not the the appropriate order of operations if that makes any sense yeah it does make sense it does you know, and you're correct because you know when we when i first started it was just me and a couple of part time people and we were just trying to keep things moving and as that began to shift more towards this model i was still doing a lot of the work and one of the things that i have been able to do and having our full-time staff that we have has allowed me to do is to uh, let go of some of those things and to delegate some of those things and, and compensate our staff for the things that they're doing that I'm no longer doing. So um, that, that has been awesome. I mean, it has freed up me to do some things that I, as an owner was not able to do previously. Well, we had a staff meeting recently or a, a group meeting, I should say. And you were baking cookies with your daughter. Yes, it was awesome. Right. <laughs> I never, never had a chance to do that. <laughs> right. So, 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 you know, I think that for, for the younger or the less uh, developed gym owner who's listening to this, what I believe they should take from what you just described is when you're start like the, the, the unique thing that CrossFit as an entity uh, afforded the marketplace that didn't previously exist was come grind it out. You can open for a $3,000 affiliate fee and some old used equipment and you can grind it out and make yourself something of a living, whether the, you know, the ceiling was certainly limited, but something. And then when there's surplus, you can hire somebody else to help you with some of that stuff. And maybe that person doesn't need to be a full-time coach if, if the model is really just supervision of fairly healthy people trying to become more fit. What you've elected to do is something that 
we all, you and I believe is going to be more impactful for the members, for the staff, for yourself, for your legacy, for the community, all of that, than anointing supervisors who are part-time pay. And in doing that, you've, you've continued to decide to reinvest in the business before investing in yourself. Somebody else could have chosen, I'm going to do the same thing Angie's doing, but I'm going to invest in myself earlier on because there's enough of investment into the business. You follow what I'm describing there? Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and, and when we think about some of the biggest companies in the world, like an Uber, for example, a Facebook, for example, companies like this went a long time losing money before they made any money because of all the investments that they put back into them. And now we'd all be happy to have those CEOs funds, mm-hmm. right? Um, just an interesting thing to, to think about as you continue yeah. to, to grow it. What are some of the things that you and Ken, who has been the, the mentor assigned to you, have discussed are ways that you're going to be able to create the financial freedom that you deserve from the gym that you and the team have created that, that maybe you aren't doing yet or weren't doing yet? What are the things that you're going to pull financially that will allow that to happen? One is going to be more of a focus on individualized programming. So we already run ID programming or individual design programming. Um, you know, reflective of the active life model in terms of, of, you know, really focusing on helping people reach individual goals um, within sort of the group class format. So our goals uh, for this year are going to be increase those numbers um, and really help people reach individual goals more. Um, we're sort of right-sizing our rates. Um, that's one thing that we as an organization haven't done since I bought the gym in 2018 is made any changes to rates. Um, and so we're going to have to do that. Um, we're going to have to, you know, recognize that there's the value that we provide and we have increased our value to our customers significantly over the last couple of years. Um, and our rates have to reflect that. Um, and it just, it's the reality of the situation. Um, those are probably the two biggest fo- foci, foci, mm-hmm. um, focuses of, um, you know, of the next two years is those two things. So if I, first of all, that's amazing that the next two years, we're going to focus on making sure that our rates are appropriate and our offers match what we want to be able to deliver. That's it. Compared to the list of things that could potentially be what you said, uh, you mentioned that you haven't affected rates since you first opened the gym. And if I'm understanding that correctly, what it first happened was you bought the gym and you set everybody to the same price. And then since you did that, you haven't changed the rate at all. No. Before we started speaking, you mentioned that you're really trepidatious around rate changes. And the staff at this point is actually less. Yes. Can you talk about that? Because I think that oftentimes gym owners find themselves in the opposite position where possibly you found yourself when you first opened the gym. Uh, would it be fair? I, would it be fair to say that the, the staff understands the value more than you know I do? I, I, maybe. Um, I it's it's a scary place to find myself in to do that because I know that I'm going to lose members. I know that people are going to say, you know what, I, I either don't see the value in that um, or look, I just can't afford it or, you know, whatever. Um, my staff, because of everything I have taught them, because of everything we have learned um, over the last 18 months to two years, um, recognize that this is something that has to be done, that because we have increased our value, because my staff are providing, you know, top quality services in a, in an environment that, you know, we have bought a new building. Um, we've made all these upgrades, you know, physically, and then in, increase the level of professionalism, increase the level of training uh, and education in our staff. Um, that all comes at a price and we provide significant value to the members of our community. And, 
So, and, and my staff are like, yes, this is, we get it. We know we have to do this. Um, and for me, it is, it's a very, it, it's a very scary place to be. And it, it's, it's funny because I just got an email from a subscription service that I get in one of those clothing, you know, they get every month. And it was an email and it just said, Hey, cost of services have gone up. Your rate next week or next month is going to go up 20 bucks. And I went, Oh, okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. If, you know, so as a customer, I'm like, ah, okay, I get it. So I don't know why it's just such this, this mental game. I play with myself for some reason, but this is going to be, you know, significant. Because I think the difference is your perception is a company like that has always been someone who you've communicated with via email. And like there, there, it's not a, I know the owner of that company. I know the, they know my kids, they know where I go right. to work. It's been, I buy clothes from them and right. I pay them a subscription fee to help get the right clothes to me every month. And that's, that's it. Uh, right. And what you've decided is, yeah, it's worth 20 bucks more to continue getting their support on that. And some people will probably be like, Oh, fuck them and cancel the subscription. And right. they're probably looking at it as how many dollars came in last month? What did that cost us to service? How many dollars are coming in now? What will that cost us to service? Great. And while they care about Angie Halverson, they care more about their company being viable so that they can continue to serve and grow people like you. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it is interesting, <laughs> isn't it? When, when we put ourselves on the other side of things. It is. It's, you know what? It's, it's hard. Uh, it's hard because we look at other companies and assume everything is great in their castle, right? And, and they can raise rates and lose 15, 20% of their client base and be just fine. When that might not be true at all, but it's our perception looking at them from the outside in, and we don't get to experience the emotion that they go through. So we get it. When it's our own, it's when does, is this where the bottom falls out? Is this when right. people start to think I'm a terrible person? How do you talk to, do you talk to other gym owners, other people in the fitness space who still have the mindset of, we're not supposed to do this to make money? Not so much. I, I honestly, I mean, my, my engagement with gym owners in the fitness space is right now pretty much the active life crowd. And with the exception, I mean, obviously, you know, as a new cohort comes in, you hear these same kind of questions, but Mm -hmm. as they, you know, exist in the program for a period of time, those questions become less and less. So, you know, I guess I do to some degree just through our calls with active life, but, um, I really don't, don't engage outside of the active life sphere a whole lot with other gym owners. You know, it's funny you say that because every time that a new gym comes in and we'll post a question inside of the group or ask a question on a call that I understand is that they're still in a mindset that, that will change, that we know will change, but right now they're in it. And then I hear them ask a question on the call and I see 25 other faces who have been there, but are not there anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh man. All right. I, it just every time it's, it, it's, it's crazy that it's just, that's where everybody starts. Yeah, it's it is. And I look back, I look back, you know, we've been in doing this with you guys for almost two years now. And I look mm-hmm. back at where we were and I feel like I'm looking back at my childhood. You know, I look at back at how far we've really come and we have, we've come so far. Um, and, um, you know, God, I wouldn't want to go back to that again. Um, when Maria was just telling me today, as we were talking about this whole rate conversation, she's like, you've done a lot harder things. Mm-hmm. You know that, don't you? You have done a whole lot harder than this. Yeah. So just, you know, you got to make it. Is there anything I didn't ask you about that you think would be valuable to share with the, uh, the active life world as they listen to this? You know, I don't think so. I mean, I think we covered a lot of, of the key points. I, I think, you know, and, and I guess last parting thoughts would be that it, it does get hard sometimes. Um, and, you know, again, the, the Friday calls that we do with the Active Life Gym uh, owners, like you were saying, you know, we hear some of these same questions. And on the last Friday call, there was, Britt was asking about, um, mm-hmm. I don't remember exactly the, oh, some of the programming changes or something I think she was talking about making. And 
I think the bottom line is that if you've got a vision and you know what that vision is, you may not know how necessarily to get there the first time. And it may take a couple of times to kind of figure that out. But holding on to that vision is, is critical and not chasing after every, you know, leaf that blows by in the wind um, because you're afraid you're going to miss the, you know, the, miss the boat sticking to the vision and holding on to that it'll happen and you know we say that to people who are in the in the gym you know believe in yourself it'll happen and it it goes the same thing for for all of this and it does get hard but you know not doing it is also hard um and you just got to hold on to that what you're speaking to there is the idea that once you have a plan all of the things that once looked like good ideas are looked at through a different lens. Like if we're driving from here to there, that stop that you just asked about making it's four hours out of the way where previously it was like, yeah, we can go to that water park. Sure. Well, it might seem like a good idea and a fun thing to do, uh, but it is not going to get you where you're trying to go. Angie Halverson, thank you for coming on today. Where can people find you and more about your gym? We are at carlislecore.com and uh, we're in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, Angie. Appreciate it, Sean. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Active Fund Podcast. Remember, if you feel inspired by our vision to humanize the healthcare industry, professionalize the fitness industry, and empower individuals to live their lives to reclaim their physical freedom, to develop careers, helping people reclaim their physical freedom. All you need to do is head to activelifeprofessional.com, find the appropriate link that represents you, and get in contact. We'll see you there. John Brown.